chip and pin has now been in the UK for just over five years and it has had quite a lot of impact, although not always the impact that was hoped or first envisaged. And in this talk, I'm going to discuss how things have worked and what things have failed to work. I'll use the term EMV quite a lot, and this is the name of the system that is behind chip and pin. It stands for the original designers, Europay, which got eaten by MasterCard, um, MasterCard themselves and Visa, who were the original um, team which designed it, although more members have since joined there. And this is the, by far the dominant smart card uh, system for payments. It's now deployed in pretty much every country. The only notable ex exception is the US, which don't currently use EMV. Um, they just use magnetic stripe cards. But there's a lot of pressure from the merchants to try to introduce this because currently they are paying uh, very high fraud costs <coughs> compared to other countries. It's suitable for both point of sale and ATM transactions. Um, I'll be mainly talking about point of sale, but the same underlying technology is used in the UK. Other countries are different. Uh, for example, Germany use the MagStripe for many ATM transactions, whereas the chip for many point of sale transactions. And it works for both credit and debit. Uh, from the perspective of the system itself, it doesn't really know much about whether it's a credit or debit card. It works basically the same, and it's really how it gets billed that differentiates the two different systems. And this is extremely widely deployed. Uh, the last set of figures are 750 million cards. Uh, it's now over a billion cards are deployed using EMV, even though it's had comparatively little scrutiny from the academic community. But because we've been looking at it, we hear a lot of information from um, ordinary members of the public. And what they say is that quite often, when they're the victim of fraud, they talk to their bank, and the bank will say that because this is a chip and pin transaction, they're not going to be refunded for their losses because the banks claim that EMV is infallible, so they end up not getting their money back. The common response is, um, you can't clone a chip card, therefore it was your card, it was your PIN, and so it's your fault that you've lost the money. And the British Crime Survey last year found that 44% of fraud victims don't get all of their money back. So it's a significant problem. To look at how chip and pin has had an effect on fraud, we can look at the, the total fraud figures. And the UK is fairly good in this regard because they actually publish them. That's not the case for all countries. And the particular period we're interested in is the time in which chip and pin was being rolled out. So it, it started round about 2002, 2003, and then by 2005, it was fully rolled out and it was mandatory for all the UK banks. And we can see some interesting things um, in terms of fraud. The categories of fraud that we're quite interested in are these ones. So there's counterfeit cards, someone taking a card, um, somehow cloning it or getting the details, making a fake card and then using it. Lost and stolen card, where the wrong person uses a legitimate card. And mail non-receipt, which is where the card that is sent to you from the bank never gets there, but it's intercepted along the way. And chip and pin was designed to try to reduce all of these. The, it had the chip to make it harder to copy cards, and it had the pin to make sure that if you store a card or you intercepted one in the mail, you wouldn't be able to use it. And if we look at the figures to see how successful this is, it's a bit of a, a mixed batch. Um, counterfeit fraud went down initially, so the chip did make things a bit harder, but then it went started going up again, so that didn't work out too well. On the other hand, the pin aspect of chip and pin seems to work reasonably well. Lost and stolen went down fairly gradually, and mail on the receipt went down fairly dramatically. But the big difference is that by the time chip and pin was in the middle of its deployment, None of these things were the serious problem. It was card not present transactions. Uh, 
So these are transactions like internet, mainly internet, also phone, where the card is not physically present. There's no pin being used, there's no chip being used, and so the criminals who were having problems with these categories of fraud simply moved up there, and the levels of fraud rocketed. And we can also look at why fraud didn't reduce um, that much for counterfeit cards. One reason is that the chip and pin terminals were not particularly well designed. They process your PIN because you type it in and they have your card, so they have access to all the details that are being read off the chip and your PIN, and they're supposed to protect these. But we found out that if you drill a hole in the back of these and then put in a paper clip, then you can hook on to the single communication line which is being used for sending the PIN and your card details in an unencrypted form. Once you've got these, you can then simply record them onto one of these um, blank cards. We've done this with just a, a store, lo uh, store loyalty card and then use it as a counterfeit card. But card.present went up even more dramatically and one of the reasons for that is phishing. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen something a bit like this where you're asked to go to a website and, and give... Um, various details, date of birth, social security number, this is targeted to Americans, and then your PIN and your cards, CVV, and basically everything that they could think of. And that would then be used for committing fraud. But what we found out this year, the latest set of figures, is that card.present dropped for the first time since records began. And one of the reasons for this is that the Verify by Visa system and MasterCard Secure Code were introduced. The way these work is that when you are going through the final stage of an online transaction, then it will ask you for some details of your card and your name, um, your email address and passwords. Depen it really depends a lot on the bank. And then this data then gets sent back to the bank which issues you the card and verified. So it means if you've just got someone's card number and expiry date, then that's not quite enough to commit fraud. And not only did counterfeit fraud, uh, not only did card not present fraud reduce, but also counterfeit fraud reduced. I mentioned that criminals are found ways of tapping the details from a chip and pin terminal and then writing that to a MagStripe card. That worked because it's still possible, or was still possible, to use MagStripe cards in most countries. Because although the chip and pin system was introduced. They didn't turn off the old system because you might have people going abroad um, which don't have chip and pin readers. You might have people from the US coming here and they don't have chip and pin cards. So the MagStrike system wasn't really turned off. But it's been gradually transitioned to being disabled, especially for cards that um, are supposed to have a chip. And I think that's one of the reasons why we can see this fraud drop. Well, perhaps not the only reason, and I'll talk about that next. So if we now go over to 2009, we can see that um, the two major categories have dropped quite significantly. Um, there were some minor increases in, in other areas, but overall the, the picture looks quite good. But there's one big problem with these statistics and this data as a whole, which is that it only records losses to the shops and to the banks. It doesn't include that 44% of customers who don't get their money back. And as far as I can tell, um, none of the banks are even recording that data, let alone making it publicly available. So another reason that we might think that there's a problem there is if we look at the terms and conditions that have been introduced when these systems were deployed. So if we look at the when verified by Visa and MasterCard Secure Code were introduced, when you were registering for it and choosing your password, you are also agreeing to terms and conditions. And one of them was that you understand that you're financially responsible for all uses of RBS Secure. So this is Royal Bank of Scotland. Other banks have basically the same terms. And what this is saying is that if anyone gets your password, then suddenly that's no longer the bank's problem, but that's your problem. And so this drop of card not present fraud might be some, some down to criminals going elsewhere and also it might be that it's just no longer being counted. And we see a very similar situation for counterfeit fraud. 
many people come to us and say that they've lost their money and the bank's not refunding them. And a fairly typical response is here. This is from Amex, where the bank um, is saying that chip and pin charges cannot be disputed as a card would have had to be in possession when the charges are put through. So this is definitely fraud, but it's no longer a fraud that falls on the bank or on the merchant, it's on the customer. And so that never appears in those sorts of statistics. Another section that's quite interesting is online banking fraud. This is fairly small, but out of the 2009 figures, this is the only one which went up. So I think criminals are starting to move over to this area. And there are, are certainly plenty of weaknesses in the um, online banking systems that are used in the UK. They're far, far behind ones used in, for example, Germany. Um, and I think this is where a lot of the, the growth in fraud is going to be. And now Stephen's going to show us a video. That was a remarkably revealing video. OK, over to you again, Stephen. So that was a year ago, and the attack still works. So this is a fairly technical audience. So what you heard on Newsnight was the, the impact of this, but they didn't talk very much about what's actually going on. To understand that, I first have to give a very simplified explanation of how EMV works. Uh, I say simplified because the full EMV specification is over 4,000 pages long. It, you think it, it, something as simple as making a payment to the till will be simple? Um, it, it could be. It sh probably should be, but it's not. But this is how things generally work in the UK, and it misses out some of the more ugly details, but it's generally correct. Here, um, a customer is using their smart card and they plug it in to the chip and pin terminal. The first stage that happens is called card authentication. Here, the card sends to the terminal um, the card details, things like the, the number, expiry date, name, and for everything it sends, it also gives a digital signature. Then the customer types in the pin, and the terminal sends the pin unencrypted to the card. And then the card then checks it against the one that's got stored. Um, it makes sure the wrong pin hasn't been entered too many times, and then it will say yes or no back. Assuming that all happens fine, then transaction authorization happens. And this is really the most important stage of EMV. The terminal sends to the card a description of the transaction, so the amount, what type it is, whether it's ATM or a point of sale, um, the date and some random numbers. And then the card takes that details, checks that it's OK, and then generates a message authentication code over it. So a cryptographic result that um, incorporates both the transaction and a key that is shared between your card and the bank which issued you that card. Then there is online transaction authorization. In principle, this is optional, but in the UK, this happens almost universally. This is where the chip and pin terminal connects over the internet or through a phone line to a bank, and then from that bank onto your issuing bank and checks whether this transaction should go ahead. Um, it, first of all, it sends the MAC, so, and then your bank will check whether that's correct, and it'll also send the details of the transaction, not just to check whether it matches the MAC, but also to make sure that you have enough money in your account and your card hasn't been reported stolen and, and all these sorts of things. And then the bank will send back to the terminal um, a yes or no answer. So that all seems fairly sound, but there's some problems with it. And to see the problems, we need to look in a little bit more detail at transaction authorization. So when I said that it sends a transaction, um, these are things like the amount, currency, date, nonce, but also the TVR. The TVR is the terminal verification results. And what that says is, firstly, did the pin verification fail? So did someone type in the wrong pin? And that's one bit. And there's another bit that says, was the pin required and not entered? So it doesn't say who requires it, but for some reason, why the terminal believes that the pin was required and it wasn't entered. How this is actually expressed in the specification is with this diagram. And what this is saying is that in this byte, you set these bits if these things are going to be set. Um, so if something went wrong, then you set bit 8. Um, and then 
there was something about pin pads not being present. That doesn't happen very often. The interesting one was pin entry required, pin pad present, but pin was not entered. And what I found when I was looking at this is it's actually quite unclear when to set these bits because uh, what happens if the pin pad present and then the customer opted to do a signature tr transaction, which is at least permitted by the specification, does that mean the pin is required or does it not? And the more I was thinking about that, the more I thought that if I have been looking over the specification for close to five years now and I'm not really sure what is going to be done, someone who is under commercial pressure to ship some software is not going to come out with a reliable answer. And while that in itself is not directly a security vulnerability, it means that the banks which are processing this TVR are not going to be able to rely on the result because sometimes it will just be wrong. And I think that is the main reason that this attack works. So based on that table, we can see that if everything is fine, the TVR should be all zeros because the cartholder verification succeeded and then none of the other bad things went wrong. But let's suppose that the pin is not required by the terminal because the customer decided not to enter in a pin and decided to sign. Then the TVR still zeros because cartholder verification didn't happen, which means that it didn't fail, it just didn't happen. And the pin is not required. So again, it's all zeros. And you've got these two cases which the bank can't tell the difference. One is a signature transaction, another one is a successful pin transaction. So what happens if we can trick the terminal into believing it's a pin transaction and trick the card into believing that it is a signature transaction? Will the transaction still work? And we did some experiments and it turns out yes. So what this allows to happen is that criminals can steal a card, put it into a little gadget, and then use that stolen card while it's not cancelled with the wrong pin and the card will be happy because it thinks it was a signature transaction, and the terminal will be happy because it got an answer back from what it thought was the card to say that everything is fine. So in a bit more detail, how the criminal would set things up is they build this little gadget, which they plug the real card into it, and then this fake card comes out the other side, and that's what was shown in the video. When... We move to the card authentication stage, nothing is changed. So whatever gets sent from the blue card it goes to the terminal without being modified. And that means that this digital signature that happens at this stage happens fine. And so the terminal is very happy. Then the criminal enters in 0000, 000 as a pin, or anything, it really doesn't matter. And now the terminal sends to this man-in-the-middle device the pin of 0000, 000 and then it replies immediately, yes, that was correct. It will say yes to anything. But from the card's perspective, it never sees either of these messages. It just sees the say skipped, as if this was some sort of other way of verifying the card holder, for example, signing it or, or just skipping that stage. Then we go into the transaction authorization, and again, this happens without any modifica modification. And then the data that comes back from transaction authorization goes to the bank and the bank can't see that anything is wrong because it sees that the terminal verification results are fine and it sees that the Mac is correct because nothing's been tampered with. So if we look into a bit more detail about why the TVR is the way it is, the first question is, did pin verification fail? Well, the card thinks no because it was never attempted and the terminal thinks no because it succeeded. It sent a pin and got the answer yes back. And if we look at the next bit, was the pin required and not entered? Um, the card, no, because the card doesn't require the pin. The card is designed to work in situations where the pin is not entered. For example, if the pin pad is broken or it's not present, as it happens in some cases, or you've forgotten your pin and the merchant has decided to let you go ahead. And the terminal doesn't think that's because the pin was entered correctly from its perspective. So you have a consistent set of beliefs between the card and the terminal, so all the cryptography checks out, but the pin was wrong and the transaction still goes through. So we did a lot of this work in November 2009. We reported that to the banks, 
and then we made it public in February. When it, we reported them to initially, we were hoping that they would talk to us and we could offer some help to them. Um, in practice, what actually happened is they said nothing. When we started talking to the press, then they started paying attention and they sent out uh, a press release. And one of the things that they said in this press release was, when a card company receives a claim about a fraudulent transaction from a customer, they will always rely on primary evidence to review the facts of the case and would never use a paper receipt, which, in fact, they could only see if the customer provided the copy for evidence as suggested. So what they're saying here is that just because the receipt in these fraudulent transactions say that PIN verified does not mean that the transaction could not be disputed. But, in fact, this is wrong. Here's a, a letter from American Express again, um, where, where they say that we were provided a copy of the till receipts confirming these charges were verified by PIN. And this is for about um, 8K worth of transactions um, made with a, a stolen card. And just because the receipt said that it's been verified, the customer didn't get their money back, even though I've shown that the PIN verified written on your receipt isn't worth the paper it's written on. <coughs> Another thing that APAX said, um, UK Cards Association now, is that the industry is confident that the forensic signature of such an attack is easily detectable within the data available at the time of the transaction. So this is a bit of a simplification. It's not easily detectable because we've, looked, we've talked to the people who are responsible for detecting it. But what they don't say is that they will detect it, just that it's detectable. And we've been doing this attack on and off for the past year, and none of our transactions have been flagged up as being in any way unusual. And we just tried this um, a few weeks ago, and the flaw is still present. One of the reasons for this is that bank systems are notoriously hard to change. Um, in, for example, one of the main systems that is used for authorising transactions and would need to be changed um, in order to fix this problem um, is written in Tau. Has anyone, does anyone here know Tau? One person knows Tau. Excellent. Two? Okay. So that's tandem application language. Um, this is used in the tandem series of computers, which has now been bought by HP. These computers are extraordinarily reliable, and so the banks love them. But there aren't that many people who know the programming languages necessary to make these changes. And they might not even have all the source code in order to be able to compile up a new version with the fixes that they need and also all the fixes that have been introduced over time. Another reason that things have gone wrong is that the banks really don't understand their own records, or at least most of the people in the banks don't understand their own records. So here's a, a letter from a bank, this is Halifax, um, listing a set of fraudulent transactions. I um, think this is about 8K worth of transactions which happened in Turkey. And they say at the bottom that all successful transactions were authorised with a genuine card and correct PIN. Therefore, whoever performed these transactions had access to your card and full knowledge of your PIN. A cl clone card was not, not in operation. And this was the justification for why the bank didn't refund the money. But when I looked into a little bit more detail and got a copy of the receipt, I found that it included this section. And um, this is the first byte, second byte, and the second, um, third byte is OX08. And when you decode that, then with the table I showed you earlier, that says that the pin entry required, the pin pad was present, but the pin was not entered. So this wasn't a chip and pin transaction. It was a chip and signature transaction. But for whatever reason, the bank in this case interpreted it as a chip and pin transaction and refused to refund the customer. Now, <laughs> in this case, when we told this to the bank, the, the bank um, ended up giving the, the money back. But it does illustrate the difficulties that customers face when they're trying to explain things to the bank. Um, another thing that UK Cards Association said is that neither the banking industry nor the police have any evidence of criminals having the capability to de deploy such sophisticated attacks. Our research suggests that the criminal interest in chip-based attacks is minimal at this time as they're un unable to find ways to make sufficient amounts of money from any of the plausible attack scenarios. So this is the, the generic thing, which is criminals are too, too stupid in order to attack the banks. <laughs> and 
you've seen from the explanation of that attack that this is not hugely challenging. And in fact, one of our master's students, who didn't have much electronics experience before, um, decided that he'd want to build this thing. And then after a few months, he came up with this. So this is a, a very small device that you put the stolen card on this side, and then you've got a fake card hanging off the other side. Um, it's probably a few hundred lines of software um, running on the microcontroller, and this is able to very successfully carry out that attack. And the level of difficulty of building this is far, far below the level of difficulty of building a card skimmer, for example. So there are plenty of criminals that have the capability of building a, a device like that, and there's plenty of evidence that the banks at least do not have the ability to detect this attack. So that was the, the situation um, up till February, and then things were fairly quiet. But for some reason, things got a bit hotter in December 2010. The, the UK Cards Association sent us a letter saying that um, they didn't like our research and they wanted it to be removed. They didn't write to us, they, they wrote to the head of PR for the university. But fortunately, that request um, eventually got down to us. And they said that the publication of this level of detail, which really breaches the boundary of responsible disclosure, essentially it places in public domain a blueprint for building a device which purports to exploit a loophole in the security of chip and pin. Consequently, we would ask that this research be removed immediately from the public. And this is quite strange, because this is over a year after we told them about it the first time, and over a year since they first had the opportunity to fix it. So not much has changed over there. And there's also some fairly deep misunderstanding. For example, that we actually published the source code for carrying out this attack. That's not true. Uh, we left out um, some of the, the critical stages. So it's... There's not enough information in, in there to simply copy our attack. It would require some intelligence in order to do so as well. Um, understandably, we didn't take that offline. So this is the, the response from Professor Ross Anderson. Um, and he said that you seem to think that we might censor a student's thesis, which is lawful and already in the public domain, simply because a powerful interest finds it inconvenient. This shows a deep misconception of what universities are and how we work. Cambridge is the University of Erasmus, Newton of Darwin, censoring writings that offend the powerful is offensive to our deepest values. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I think, was quite a shock to the, the banking industry. And the, the thesis is still up there. And, in fact, by trying to remove it, it triggered a lot more attention. And <laughs> here is a, a list of um, a few of the, the places where this was featured. And... Uh, there are 103 news articles at the time that I looked. And then if we look at the number of downloads of the thesis, the thesis <laughs> you can see that um, this is round about when the letter, well, the letter was sent out here and then it went through various channels and then it became public here and that's where it was featured on Reddit and that's where it's featured on Slashdot. So it was highly counterproductive. Okay, so... In that um, talk, I, I hope I've been able to persuade you that EMV is not infallible. And it's not fair that simply stating that because it is a chip and pin transaction, that the victims are not being entitled to get the money back. And now, I'm happy to take questions. And if you want to know more, then have a look at our blog. And now, I'm happy to take questions. And if you want to know more, then have a look at our blog. I, I'm going to somewhat argue the case for the banks. Um, but it's not a case that I feel particularly strongly about, and I certainly don't work for a bank. Um, the, the issue here is surely that any security system probably contains flaws and will eventually be compromised. To replace the whole of the card banking system within one country, worldwide, or whatever, is a very great undertaking. So it does seem to me that the only choice the banks have is to predict the period during which the system will remain secure and have the new replacement system ready to field at the end of that period whether or not they're aware of any compromise. Do you think they can do better than this? I think, yes, I think there are, are a few ways they could do better. Uh, one th way that that would happen is um, it is very true that the banks... Um, are not trying to build a 100% secure system, and they shouldn't, because that would be far too expensive. 
what they should be doing is trying to find a system that is um, a good compromise between the investment into the system and the losses of fraud that it would incur. Unfortunately, that's not quite working because if the banks want to build a new system, they spend the money. But if there are flaws in the bank security system, it's the customers which are losing. So there's misaligned incentives between the customers and the banks. And I think that's one of the reasons that the banks aren't deploying all the security systems that they could. Um, so in particular, the fraud detection systems are not as good in the UK as in many other countries. And those are fairly successful at reducing fraud. Whereas the chip and pin system costs probably £2 billion pounds to roll out. And I don't think it's saved £2 billion pounds worth of fraud losses. But it has managed to shift liability from the, custom, from the banks to the customer. So it hasn't necessarily been beneficial in an overall perspective, but it has been beneficial to the banking industry. Um, as for trying to what they could do better, um, one thing would be to listen to researchers. Um, because we said, for example, um, I think three years ago, that chip and pin terminals had a flaw which allowed you to intercept the card details in the pin. And the response was to say, essentially, criminals are too stupid to do that. And then two years later, criminals were doing it, and then the bank scrambled into fixing it. And it took them over a year to do anything about it. So they had a year worth of fraud, uh, when instead, if they'd been able to predict that this would have happened, they could have very leisurely rolled out a fix, and then the criminals would have been... Um, prevented from doing this fairly obvious thing um, when they actually were able, able to do it. So I think being better at predicting the future would be very useful, and I think they could do that. Okay, so they, they effectively had the time to do the right thing, and they chose not to do it because they either didn't want to or because they didn't believe the analysis. Yeah, certainly in, in that case, and there are probably other examples. Are you aware of any legal cases that have been I think obviously if, if um, it's obviously in this p particular country quite expensive to, to risk taking the banks to task over this for an individual that may have lost out or possibly lost out um, are you aware of any situation that that is been, been approached that obviously the banks do not want this to go to court have you, are you aware of any situation where they've paid out of court before any proceedings? Or has it just not got there at all? The banks are quite reluctant for things to go to court. But if they do make it, then they're very aggressive at prosecuting it. So, for example, I was an expert witness in a court case where a Halifax customer um, sued his bank over some disputed transactions. And this person was a refugee, so he had no money and no ability to earn money. So although he was putting himself at risk at a very large loss because he would have to pay the legal fees if he lost, um, it wasn't particularly a problem for him because he'd never be able to pay it. Um, so he did, loss, uh, he did lose, and this was over a £3,000 transaction, and the bank put at least £50,000 worth of lawyer time into it, and they never got that money back. So, and they knew they were never going to get the money back, so it's clear that they didn't want to seem to set any precedent where they would admit any weaknesses. Um, the trial was overall fairly disappointing because I was there to look at the technical evidence and the bank lost it. There was essentially no technical evidence presented as to what happened. But under the UK system, the fact that you lose evidence is not really held against you unless it was clear that you did this maliciously. So the, the judge judged on the very small amount of information available, and then um, he sided with Halifax. It was essentially the, the judge was in, explained that he was in a very awkward position where he had to make a decision, and I think all he had to go on was the, the character of the people involved. Um, there, I'm, I'm aware of a, another case, which is um, Emma Wolfe. Um, she, was a vic um, she was a card fraud victim, and she was with Abbey, now Santander Bank. And... It, there were a, a series of fraudulent ATM withdrawals and she said that she didn't do them. Um, Santander said that um, it must have been her because her card and her pin were used um, and the bank actually accused the, her fiancé of um, carrying out this fraud 
and then this was rolling on for at least six months. And then the police showed up at the home of one of the bank employees and found piles of account details. So it was a bank employee who was almost certainly um, changing the address of the customer, asking for a new card to be sent, and then changing the address back again. So it was a genuine card and pin, it just wasn't being used by the correct person. Uh, and at that point, the, the bank gave her her money back, but on condition that she didn't talk to the press about it. You mentioned using your, your exploiting of the, of the loophole with POS terminals. Did you actually try it with ATM? Um, we haven't tried, but we believe it will not work. Because the way that ATMs work in the UK is the PIN is not sent to the card to be checked, it's sent to the bank which issued you the card to be checked. It's encrypted and then sent over there. So I'm almost certain it wouldn't work in the UK. Maybe other countries, but not here. And do, with, your, with the situation that you encountered, which you were able to exploit, was that system using the, uh, the CVR? It was um, following the... Uh, what do you mean by using the CVR? Well, there's a card, veri card verification result as well as a terminal verification result, isn't there? Yes. OK, uh, so we were not tampering with the CVR. So um, for the, the purposes of other people here, um, when the card sends back the Mac, it sends back some other details. And one of these is a bit um, called the several bits which incorporate a bit which says, was the PIN verified or not? So what the banks see is they see the CVR which says the PIN was not verified. What they don't see is what the terminal thought because that is in a field which is optional. So on one hand, the, the card thinks um, it was a signature transaction. The terminal thinks it's a PIN transaction. And then the bank sees that it's definitely not a PIN transaction. And the bank could decide to reject all transactions which are not PIN verified. But when we saw the data that was coming back from some of the banks, that, that would re reject a significant number of non-fraudulent transactions. And trying to stop this sort of fraud requires an incredibly accurate detector because um, there are a vast number of chip and PIN transactions. And the vast majority of these are not fraudulent. So even if you have a detector, um, some way of looking for fraudulent transactions that's 99.999% trans um, accurate, then you're going to reject essentially only legitimate transactions, and that will annoy customers. Mm -hmm. So the CVR is useful, but it's not sufficient on its own to be a perfect identifier for fraudulent transactions. And that's why it's not a trivial fix to look at the CVR and try to stop that sort of fraud. I have um, two questions. One is, have you anything positive to say? And secondly, do you have any cards that you um, use yourself? I, I do use cards because my bank called me in about some suspected fraud. It, it wasn't fraud. Um, but on, on the first question, positive things to say. This is helping getting fraud victims get their money back. Um, we're pointing this out. And then sometimes the bank just gives back the money to the customer. Um, and in some cases, it's causing the banks to hand over more information, which allows us to establish what's really going on. And I think as an academic, I'm, I'm quite interested in finding out what is really going wrong with the system. Um, and this doesn't necessarily mean that the customers get off. Um, they don't get, always get their money back. But we find out a little bit more about what happened. Um, an example of this is um, a case of where someone in South Africa uh, lost a bunch of money from his uh, bank account through transactions in London and the bank diners club didn't give his money back and I wasn't involved in this course case but um, Ross Anderson was and he went to um, the, the high court to argue this and was able to show that the bank's evidence was complete nonsense um, then what the bank did was hired a private investigator and found out that um, on the time that this fraud happened, um, this, the fraud victim's brother was on a plane to London, or was uh, just arrived uh, from a plane to London. And what's more, his plane ticket was bought by the same person who bought the plane ticket for a bunch of other people who also had this happen to them.
So it looks like some sort of criminal gang were doing fraudulent transactions and um, in this way and then saying that it wasn't them. So by showing flaws in the technical system, we were able to get um, the person um, charged with the right crime rather than the wrong crime. But we'll know a bit more. Are there any other problems with this system that we should be aware of? With chip and pin, I mean. There's none that I have not talked about, but there was 4,000 pages of specification, and every time we look at it, we find something new. So I think, like any complex system, there will be plenty of bugs. Uh, in particular, I don't know what's going on with ATM fraud, because the majority of people who come to us saying that they've lost money has been because of an ATM transaction. And some of those can be explained by crooked bank insiders, but probably not all of it. And there are some people who have very credible stories as to why the, their PIN could not have been compromised. In some cases, they didn't even know their PIN. Um, but I don't have an adequate explanation for that. Maybe it's just bad luck, um, but maybe there are some security problems there that we haven't found yet. Suppose EMV Co., who own the standard, said, come to you and your colleagues and say, OK, we, okay, clearly this is not, clearly it's not right. What would be your priority list of things to do? What, wh where, would you, where would you start? Another question is, is this something that the banks themselves could fix in their, process, their host systems, their own processing, or is it actually so fundamental to EMV that we'd need to EMV too, say? So I think my priority to EMV Core would be to dramatically shrink the specification. So it starts off using a few hundred pages, now it's a few thousand. Um, I think it could be written in less than 100, um, mainly by trimming out the options that are either very rarely used or, or not used at all, and then slightly expand the scope. So the EMV says how, for, um, how a card can talk to a terminal and there be able to interoperate. It doesn't say anything about security, or almost nothing about security. So I think um, the specification to say what are the security properties that should be there, how they should be maintained, and then how the system works. And I think that can be probably less than 50 pages because it is, as it's used in the UK, it's a very simple system, but because of all the other options, um, it's become hugely complicated. And what was your second question? Replacing cars is very slow and expensive. Um, is there anything that could be done by the banks, certainly in the issuing end, to look for C in CVR? And is if EMV Co. as the owner of the, stand, uh, owner of the standard were to insist that this data were carried in transactions, would that then, then give the banks the ability to spot the kind of compromises that are going on? So there's a few things that could be done, um, but it's not really necessary to replace the cards. Uh, it is necessary to replace the software or, or change the software on the back-end authorization systems. Um, in particular, they should compare the CVR, which is mandatory, well, in Visa and MasterCards it's certainly mandatory, um, with some other way of working out what the terminal thought was going on, and that's the hard part. Um, cards could be changed to request the CVMR, cardholder verification method results. Um, some do, some don't. Um, in the UK, there's a different standard, um, APAC standard 70, which says that the CVMR should be sent back um, at least to um, the bank which is, has a commercial relationship with the shop, even though that doesn't get back all the way to the issuer. And when we talk to people about implementing this, it should work in paper and it doesn't work in practice because sometimes um, the CVMR generated by the terminal is just wrong. Um, sometimes it's complete nonsense. It, it talks about um, pin was not entered, but uh, sorry, pin was entered, but pin pad not present. So things that just just cannot exist, and and that's just bugs. And the bugs haven't been caught because so far issuers have not been relying on the CVMR to make any to make any decisions. And another issue is that CVMR is sometimes lost on the way back to the issuing bank. And I think the specification does allow a secure system to be built. It doesn't forbid it, but it doesn't give you very much help. So I think if the specification gave a bit more help and a bit more testing for these cases, then that would be very useful. Is part of the problem here also the fact that the where you've got to detect the problem is in the issuer system, where the authorization is, 
but that you're wholly reliant on data provided by the acquiring system where the chip and the pin were actually processed. And traditionally, those two applications are totally separate and they don't, they're not operated by the same people. Yes, the, there was a big commercial problem that happened when chip and pin was introduced. So as people who are around the UK would have seen, it came in dramatically fast um, for an industry that's got a reputation of moving slowly. The way that this was done was by liability shifting. So when there was a transaction that did not ha was not a chip and pin transaction, the party which caused it not to be chip and pin was responsible for any fraud. So if the bank hadn't issued chip cards, they were responsible for fraud. And if the merchant hadn't deployed and upgraded the terminal, they were responsible for the fraud. So that gave a lot of incentive to both sides to roll out the system as fast as possible. Um, this also made the merchants very resentful because the banks were faster than them. And they covered almost all chip card fraud for quite a long time. And by the time they got to the terminals, they were very reluctant about upgrading them. And once this liability shift happened, the bank industry no longer had a stick to beat the merchants with. And so when terminals were a buggy, they weren't really able to um, introduce anything new because the issuers didn't have much of a commercial relationship with the, the cost, uh, with the people who are deploying the chip and pin terminals. So I think that was one of the reasons for, for the problems. Um, there could be some changes in, in the specification which would help that. Um, so we've mentioned about the CVR, um, and this is, this is reliable. Uh, the card really will produce a, a, um, a CVR that says the pin is not verified if it didn't get the correct pin. But the problem is that the CVR is not specified in EMV. It's specified in some MasterCard and Visa documentation. And terminals are not allowed to use that field to make a decision. Um, they would need to request, um, the, the, term, the card would need to be changed to request that the terminal send it to CVMR. Uh, sorry, the card, yeah cardholder verification method results, and then the card would then need to see if the terminal's perspective of things which are going on matches the card's perspective. And I think that would be a change to the DMV specification to allow that to happen. Um, so it, it's all very complicated and, and quite messy, and involves commercial relationships as well as technical decisions. You mentioned earlier, I think, that some of the European countries don't use this mechanism, but they have a secure mechanism. So what, what is their mechanism, and why didn't TMV choose to follow that? Nowadays, pretty much all countries use EMV, but not all in the same way. So when we discovered this flaw, we, we talked to um, the UK authorities, Financial Services Authority, um, the... Federal Reserve in the US and European Central Bank. And in response, many central banks and countries said that they were not vulnerable to this. Um, in particular, the French banks were very insistent that this did not affect them. And for France, this is a matter of national pride because they developed the, the smart card system and were very involved in EMV. And it turns out that the French were wrong. Um, we did a test on a French card and it was just as vulnerable as everyone else. Um, Germany were correct, they were not vulnerable. And that's not because they're not using EMV, but because they're using a different way of verifying the PIN. So if you take, type your PIN into a German, German point of sale terminal, almost certainly your PIN will be encrypted and then sent back to the bank. And the fraudster can't interfere easily in that communication. And that's why they're not vulnerable. The, that is actually forbidden in the UK, that way of operating. Um, the way, reason behind that is it would require giving a key, cryptographic key, to every terminal and then using this for encrypting the PIN, and that would be quite expensive. Are there any steps that we can take to prevent us falling victim to such fraud, or is it just a matter of time before we get struck? One thing you can do is not have cards, but that... <laughs> That really causes a lot of problems when trying to lead a normal life, so it's not something that, that I do. Um, another solution that some people do is to get a chip and signature card. So this is where your card does not have a PIN, and therefore um, the bank cannot say that your PIN was correctly entered because it doesn't really have one. Um, banks are very reluctant to give you these 
but they're legally required to under Disability Discrimination Act. Um, if you can persuade them that you cannot remember a PIN, and that there are a lot of people who can't, um, or you can't safely enter it, um, then they're obliged to, to give you a chip and sig signature card. That would not be accepted everywhere, so you might run into problems using it, but it puts you in, in a better legal position. Um, as for preventing it, there's not too much you can do. What you can do quite a lot is dealing with it when it happens. So a mistake that many people do, and very understandable, is that the bank will ask you to cut up your card, and then the customer will then cut up their card. But actually, the card contains evidence which can be used to clear your name. Um, at a very minimum, it will contain the number of transactions that have happened. So if the bank says that um, there were... Um, 10 legitimate transactions and 10 fraudulent ones, and your card says it knows about 12 transactions, then clearly there's another card that is, is in operation with your account details. So definitely don't cut up your card. Um, another thing um, you can do is ask for as much evidence as possible as soon as possible. Because what will frequently happen is the bank will give you your money back initially, and then a few months down the line they'll take it back off you again and say that it's actually your fault. And by that time all the evidence is gotten. Whereas if you ask for all the evidence up front, so um, all the technical details and also things like CCTV, then it means that if the bank then backs down and does take the money off you, then you've actually got something to show them. You seem to remember that um, Sainsbury's had a whole batch of card readers that had been tampered with and sent card numbers and perhaps pin de details to an outside agency. If I remember rightly, it was something like the... Um, the readers were made in the Far East. They were sent to Sainsbury's via distributor in, I think, India. And there was an employee or a group of employees there who physically tampered with the things and put a little radio transmitter inside it so it apparently worked all right, but as well was sending out this spurious radio signal. Um, is the system still vulnerable to that kind of thing, or has that particular way of criminals addressing it been blocked now? It's getting a lot better but it's not fully fixed because there were two potential fixes to that, one of which is making the terminals impossible to tamper with, and that was not feasible to do. They would be far, far too expensive um, and far too unreliable if the, the terminals were going to be modified in that sense. So then there were two initiatives. One was to reduce the presence of swipe and dock readers. These are readers which um, read the mag stripe. Um, and your chip data at the same time. And that means if someone tampers with one of these, then you've got your MagStripe, and then they've got your PIN, and then they can commit some fraud with MagStripe. So those things were phased out. And then the chip data was changed, so it was no longer possible to construct a valid MagStripe based on just the chip data. So if you have one of these cards, and I think they are started to be rolled out in about 2008, then... If someone tampers with a chip and pin terminal, they will get all the chip data, but they won't get the magstripe data, and that shouldn't be enough to commit fraud on itself. Do you see, just briefly, any issues potentially relating in this matter with regard to the RFID sort of close proximity cards that I know at least one major card producer are, are sending out? So I think RFID is the thing that we're going to look into next. Um, it's, it's quite difficult to look into compared to EMV because for all its flaws, EMV is a public specification. You can go on the web and download it for free. That is not the case for our FID system. Um, a lot of it's public, but the security information is not public. So we're not entirely sure what is going on there. Um, it is very similar to EMV, but it's not the same. And there are some quite important differences. Um, in some ways, it's more secure. So um, another attack that um, is possible is something called the Yes Card attack. This is where you take someone's card and then you clone the chip data onto another card. And then on this other card, you make it accept any PIN. Now, this sounds a lot like no PIN attack, but it's different because it's a fake card rather than talking to the real card. And that card will work in offline transactions because it knows all the public data um, it will say yes to any PIN, but as soon as it talks to the real bank, it will be rejected. And 
that's because UK cards are predominantly called um, our SDA, Static Data Authentication. There is an enhanced version um, of EMV called DDA, Dynamic Data Authentication, which is not vulnerable to that type of fraud. And all RFID cards are DDA in the UK. So it's improved in that sense. The, that sounds good on paper. In actual practice, it doesn't make very much difference because while SDA cards have this flaw where you can copy them, it only works on offline transactions and offline essentially never happens in the UK because phone lines are, are so cheap, phone calls are so cheap that you might as well always con contact the bank um, for it to be verified. Um, the only time I've seen um, offline transactions is buying train tickets. Do you see a time when it will be cost effective to use biometrics either in place of or in addition to pins? Um, I think cost is probably not the issue here, but it's making it work reliably enough. Um, this is something, there was a, an APAX document from 2007 um, where they said that this is something that they want to look into. Um, there's various different ways of doing it. Um, one is where your card contains the biometric template, say fingerprint. It sends it to the terminal and then the terminal checks whether it matches. But this has the problem that um, if the terminal is corrupt, then it's, well, first it's got your fingerprint, which isn't so good. And secondly, you can always say yes. Um, if you do matching on the card, then that improves some things. But how does the card know that the fingerprint it's getting is a real fingerprint and it's not just being fed some data from um, a fingerprint that was recorded somewhere else? So there, there's complications in that. Um, another one is that although banks will not publicly admit it, it is very useful to them that you can tell your PIN to someone else because very, very many people tell their PIN to other people, so um, people in their family. Um, and if you suddenly prevent customers from using other people's cards, then that will reduce the number of transactions and it will make some customers very unhappy. So it means that the father can't give the, the, the kid the credit card um, to use in emergencies and things like that. So I think those two issues will have to be dealt with before biometrics will be feasible, um, even assuming that they'll be cost effective. I hope I won't be misunderstood here, but what is the easiest kind of approach to defrauding a card? It's difficult to know because um, it really depends on, on the skill sets of the criminals carrying them out. Um, if there are very different criminal communities that deal with stealing cards versus going online and breaking into card databases and, and doing things there. Um, so I don't think there are very many people that are in the position where they could choose to do any of these because muggers typically aren't very good at breaking into encryption systems. Um, Probably the most profitable one is to go after card numbers in very large quantities. And there, I think it would be card not present transactions. So you, you, you don't intercept someone's computer because then you get one. You break into a merchant, get all their card details, and then use those for fraudulent online purchases. Um, I think there, the hardest part is more getting money out of the system um, rather than um, actually committing the fraud in the first place because you can buy goods online, but how do you actually get money? Um, one way of doing this um, I might get to see in the next few weeks because um, I'm organising a conference and I'm responsible for the credit card payments. And <laughs> one thing that, <laughs> one thing that we, we get very often is someone will register um, for a dubious card. So, for example, we've had one registrant um, who's given a Nigerian postal address but the billing address for the card he used is an oxygen cylinder, uh, oxygen cylinder supply company in Minnesota. So <laughs> that's, a bit, that's a bit iffy. And then the next step is almost certainly they will say that some terrible disaster has befallen their family. They can't come. Could they please get a refund via Western Union? Um, so that's one way of trying to get the system out of the banking industry and into the cash industry because cash can't be rolled back. Whereas... Once you're in, say, at least one country's bank industry, things can be rolled back three months later, three months after the fact, or certainly they used to be able to do that. Um, so I think getting money out is the hard part. You mentioned asking the bank for all their information. Is there a public source where one can find out what information 
one should be seeking from the bank, because clearly you say, give me all your information, and they give you not enough at their will. Yeah, um, so there's a, there are two useful resources. So one is um, the website of Stephen Mason, and the other one is Alistair Kelman, and they're both lawyers, and they both have uh, web pages on the legal situation and the sort of information that you should be asking for. But it's actually very difficult because the banks use very different IT systems and the information that they store uh, often varies quite a lot. So I don't think there is any general recommendation you can give about what sort of information to ask and then know whether they're giving you everything. Um, I think in, in this case um, the, of um, Alan Job versus Halifax, the basically the only information that came back was one byte. And there, there was one byte of, of content there. Uh, I think it was 3B. And 3B said, uh, 3B meant I was told that this was a chip and pin transaction and everything verified. And, and all these other things get compressed down. Um, there were more detailed logs in the past, but they'd gone. So I suppose the next logical question then is, if we were subjected to a fraud, which is the best bank to be with? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure, because these sort of cases don't get that far very often enough for me to make any sample. Um, so I, I can't really be confident about anything to do with that. Um, from what we've seen, it matters more about who you are rather than what the bank is. Um, so if you're well-spoken, capable of making good arguments, um, then you're probably in a very good position. Um, if you have not very much money and you're not good at dealing with authority, then you've got much less chance, a much lower chance of getting your money back. Um, and I think that, that's particularly problematic from a public policy perspective because the people who have the influence of changing policy are almost certainly never going to lose any money. Um, it's the more vulnerable members of, the, of society. Um, so I think the majority of people who come to us um, are... I think, yeah, definitely a majority are women and mainly pensioners. Um, and Alice, um, Alan Job was a refugee, so he, he was not a very good customer to the bank. Uh, but if, if you're a good customer, they won't look at the logs. They'll just give you your money bank on the basis that they don't want to lose you as a customer. Um, I would very much like to get statistics on how much banks... Um, well, first of all, how much loss there is for customers... Um, how many refused uh, re requests for refunds there are per bank. Um, but I don't think there's even enough data currently collected for that. Uh, the data that is collected is only um, per bank total fraud losses. And there are interesting things in that. The information is not public. But one thing we did find out is that in 2008, one bank was responsible for about 90% of all fraud. Um, the following year, they hired a better security team and went down to about 10 so there is very significant deviation between the banks. Um, in that, I could imagine there's very significant deviation in terms of how much, um, how, chan how much of a chance you have of getting your money back. But I don't know the answer. For this attack to work, you do have to have your cards physically stolen from you? Yes. Um, for the yes card attack I mentioned, that's a clone card, but that essentially doesn't work because of um, the situation with... Um, no offline transactions in the UK. With this one, the attack will only work if the card is stolen and has not yet been cancelled. So if you notice it's been cancelled, if you notice it's been stolen, you can tell the bank and cancel the card and this won't work. Okay, my second question is, you, you were saying that, that the card does actually report that the PIN was not entered. Yes. So in theory, the bank saying that the PIN was entered is verging on fraudulent. Uh, yeah, um, that case has certainly been made. Um, <laughs> we we have talked to the police about that, but the, they have no interest in prosecuting the banks. Um, one of the main problems is that the the part of the police that is responsible for investigating banking fraud is a dedicated check and plastic card fraud unit, which is 100% paid for by the banks. So that's one of the issues that, that, that's going on there. Um, I think the reason these things happen is, I think not so much maliciousness, but more incompetence. And part of this 
uh, 4,000 pages of specification um, is many messages that are being sent back to the bank. And the CVR can be trusted because it is generated by the card and it's authenticated by the card. But there are other flags sent back to the bank which say that the PIN is verified but cannot be relied upon because it says, for example, the terminal's perspective of whether the PIN is verified, which is wrong, versus the card, which can be relied upon. So when the data is being summarised to the fraud investigation, they may well see PIN verified when it was not verified. Okay. Have you ever managed to get back the whole log of the transaction, um, including the, the CPR? Not from legal requests. Um, occasionally it's printed on the, on the receipt, but not very often. Presumably there are options for defrauding traders with offline transactions with bogus cards and so on. I mean, the classic thing, of course, in the restaurant is where the terminal has brought to your desk where there's a two-way possibility of defrauding either side. Uh, are there any technical provisions that you can think of that would actually ameliorate those wide-open positions? So that's... So that's where the customer is trying to defraud the merchant? Where maybe a customer will try and defraud a merchant by using a bogus card where there is an offline terminal walking away with the goods and then the transaction is, is disallowed. Or where, for example, the classic one in a restaurant where the uh, device you're handed is actually a skimming device and the waiter's pocketing the change. And they're fairly basic, simple problems. I'm wondering if there's any technical measures that could reinforce us against those. So the main one that's going on for that is just forbidding offline transactions. So when chip and pin was introduced, there were 80% were online. Um, then a few years later, it was 90%, and now I think there are negligible amounts of transaction um, offline, which means that... Um, Stolen cards which are reported and cloned cards should be detected. There's still going to be software bugs, so maybe you can get by somewhere. Um, as for pre preventing skimming, you can't prevent the mag strike being read. What you can do is prevent that data being useful. And what the card industry is trying to do is push for everyone in the world to use chip-based cards and then eventually eliminate mag stripes. Uh, the big gap there is the US, because the US banks have no interest in deploying um, chip cards. Or, uh, one reason is because it would reduce the amount of interchange fees they get um, because of the way things are being set up. So, I mean, they would earn less per transaction. Um, another reason is they would not be able to do the liability shift that has happened in the UK. Um, and because in, in the US, firstly, the court system is different. Um, one is that if you sue a bank and you lose, you pay your legal fees, you don't pay their legal fees. So it's much easier to sue a bank. Um, there's some very clear law and plenty of precedent um, which says that um, if there is a fraudulent transaction, then it is the bank's problem above $50. Um, and another one is the potential for class actions. So many customers can get together and make one law case um, against a bank. In the UK, that's not permitted. You can't, you can't do class actions in general. There's a major discrepancy in liability between credit card and debit card transactions. Can you give us any information on the background to this? So when credit cards were introduced, they fell under the Consumer Credit Act, which actually gave much better protection for fraud. Um, that in, in practice, wasn't as good as it sounded because the law is only relevant when you take something to court and it's very hard and very risky to take these cases to court. Um, but things are, are starting to change. So I think last year, um, there was the Payment Services Act introduced, which was implementation of the European Union Payment Services Regulations. And that covered both credit and debit cards. And that said that um, if there was um, fraud, then the bank had to prove their systems were operating correctly. And that's good, but it's very hard to actually enforce because you can't easily sue a bank. What, um, and the institution that is um, responsible for dealing with disputed transactions before going to court is the Financial Services Ombudsman.
and they don't seem very interested in the technical, looking at the technical evidence. Um, so, for example, in, in the cases that um, I've helped with and have um, tried to give more information to the customer, when I send to the financial services ombudsman saying that you need to look at this data because your, the conclusion you reached in, in this section was incorrect, the response has always been um, uh, we rely on the information that's given to us by the banks. So it's, it's difficult to deal with, with that sort of thing.